tucked away deep in the vast expanse of the Indian Ocean, far off from the coastlines of Africa, Australia and the Indian subcontinent, lies a few tiny specks of land, the Chagos Archipelago. Some of you watching may know of the story about how the United States stole an island within the archipelago by way of a secret agreement with the United Kingdom during the days of decolonization after World War II. But for those who've not heard it, watch this video here by Johnny Harris, formerly of the Borders series on Fox, as it succinctly recounts the history of this small group of islands. Retelling this story is not what this video is about. Instead, this video will look at the Chagos Archipelago dispute as it has evolved in recent years, and how nations complicit in the situation remain so, hypocritically. You guys know what I'm talking about? While crafting the agreement that established the independent status of what had until then been known as the Crown Colony of Mauritius, the United Kingdom modified terms under request from the United States, to whom they had become indebted while developing the Polaris submarine missile technology. This agreement saw the United Kingdom excise from Mauritius the Chagos Archipelago and form the British Indian Ocean Territory, and in return saw them pay some £3 million to the fledgling Mauritian government in 1965. It must be emphasised that these agreements were classified secrets for many years, most probably because of the global wave of decolonisation present after the conclusion of World War II, and having two major powers conspiring to retain control of a colonial possession would appear to be a rather bad look for the both of them. Beginning in 1968, the United Kingdom began the forced expulsion of the Chagosian population, a process completed by April of 1973. While the United Kingdom had paid the government of Mauritius compensation to be distributed among those displaced, it simply was not. Subsequently, legal action was launched to claim the compensation to which they were owed and to try to secure their right of abode in the archipelago. This money was not distributed until 1977. Since the turn of the millennium, Chagosians have pursued their fight in various courts, both within the United Kingdom, with whom their dispute lies, and multilateral courts, within the judicial branches of the European Union and the United Nations, being forced to engage in a kind of judicial ping pong. The Chagosians' battle to return to their home islands has been fought within the walls of the British High Court and Supreme Court. They've had made against them an order in council under the royal prerogative, coming directly from the Privy Council and the Sovereign Queen Elizabeth II herself, which, after being overturned by the High Court, was then sent to the House of Lords, the upper house of the British Parliament. An application was made by the Chagosians to the European Court of Human Rights, claiming the United Kingdom had violated rights as defined by the European Convention on Human Rights. After some years, this application was rejected as it had been ruled that all claims had been raised and settled in British domestic courts. However, this is not the only multilateral court to which the Chagosian population have taken their fight. Throughout the 2010s and early 2020s, the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the International Court of Justice, and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, all judicial arms of the United Nations, would hear the case of the Chagosians in the United Kingdom. The crux of these cases would be the April 2010 establishment of the Chagos Marine Protected Area within the British Indian Ocean Territory by the UK government and the legality thereof. The United Kingdom has consistently reiterated that the Chagosians will not be allowed to return to the archipelago, a position that has been repeatedly reaffirmed by their appealing or entirely rejecting all decisions that are in favour of the Chagosians, whether in domestic or international courts. Further, the major leaking of US diplomatic cables in 2010, known as the Cablegate leak, would shed further light on the United Kingdom's position on the Chagosian situation. A leaked cable reads as follows. Her Majesty's Government would like to establish a marine park or reserve providing comprehensive environmental protection to the reefs and waters of the British Indian Ocean Territory. A senior foreign office official informed political council on May 12. The official insisted that the establishment of a marine park, the world's largest, would in no way impinge on USG use of the BIOT, including Diego Garcia, for military purposes. He agreed that the UK and US should carefully negotiate the details of the marine reserve to assure that US interests were safeguarded and a strategic value of BIOT was upheld. He said that the BIOT's former inhabitants would find it difficult, if not impossible, to pursue their claim for research settlement on the islands if the entire Chagos archipelago were a marine reserve. The cable would go on to quote Colin Roberts, head of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office of the British Government at the time. Roberts observed that BIOT has served its role very well. 
advancing shared US-UK strategic security objectives for the past several decades. The BAOT has had a great role in assuring the security of the UK and US, much more than anyone foresaw in the 1960s, Roberts emphasised. We do not regret the removal of the population. In May of 2019, the United Nations General Assembly welcomed the International Court of Justice decision that the United Kingdom had infringed on the right of self-determination of the Chagosians, and was therefore obliged to cede its control of the island, and subsequently voted to impose a deadline of six months for the United Kingdom to unconditionally withdraw its colonial administration from the area, which it failed to do. 116 nations voted in favour, 56 abstained, and 6 voted against it, those 6 being Australia, Hungary, Israel, the Maldives, the United Kingdom, and the United States. Australia, the United Kingdom, the United States. All three nations subscribe to the same ideology when it comes to foreign affairs and international relations. The rules-based order. But what is the rules-based order, and why is it so notable that these three nations seemingly fly in the face of it when it comes to the Chagos Archipelago situation? Former Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Julie Bishop has called the term rules-based order a quote-unquote semantic innovation on what it is more widely known as, the liberal international order. Regardless of what it is called, it describes a broad architecture of international governance which has developed since the end of the Second World War, and is centred around multilateral organisations and an established set of rules and norms, or more clearly, the generally accepted standards of behaviour that most states apply to themselves and others by way of a system of multilateral policy making and rule setting institutions being created alongside the development of international law. Australia has been a loyal follower of the rules-based order for many years, even during the politically tumultuous times of the 2010s, which saw no less than five Prime Ministers lead the nation during that decade. Current Australian Foreign Affairs Minister Maurice Payne has said that Multilateral organisations, such as the United Nations, create rules that are vital to Australia's security interests, values and prosperity. These bodies regulate international cooperation in key sectors of our economy, including civil aviation, maritime transport, intellectual property, telecommunications and agriculture. They promote universal values and play critical roles in responding to emerging global challenges. The United Kingdom too has vocally supported the rules-based order. UK Minister for Asia Mark Field said the following in a speech whilst on a diplomatic tour to the Philippines in 2017. The global rulebook now deals with so much more than the weapons we have and what happens when we misuse them. It deals with how we trade together and what happens if we renege on those terms. It helps protect the assets that our countries share, our air, our water, our oceans. It helps protect our wildlife and our national heritage, things that make our countries unique. And further, Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt stated in Parliament during 2019, The rules-based international system has made the world collectively massively safer and more prosperous than it has ever been before. This country played a major role in setting it up, and we will always defend it. The United States are arguably the driving force behind the rules-based international order. They've been central to its development throughout the decades, and so the conclusion to the 2015 speech to the 14th Berlin Security Conference by former ambassador to Germany, John B. Emerson, was no surprise. It read, By choosing to build on our rules-based international order and strengthen our alliances and partnerships for the 21st century, we can better meet the myriad challenges of our times. If we lift our eyes beyond our borders, if we think globally, and if we act cooperatively, we can shape the course of this century as our predecessors shaped the era after the Second World War. We need the focus, support, and collaboration of the transatlantic partners. If what any of the officials from each of these three nations have said were true, then there would be no United States military installation on Diego Garcia, and there would be no dispute over the Chagos Archipelago. If any of these nations truly believed in the rules-based international order, one built on multilateral organisations and abiding by the rules and rulings created thereby, then the United Kingdom and the United States would withdraw from the Chagos Archipelago, and Australia would call out the actions of its allies the same it would for its foes. It seems unlikely that the Chagos Archipelago situation will be resolved positively anytime soon. In the meantime, it can't help but feel like the positive impact on international security due to the UK and US presence in the archipelago are spoiled by the fact that they're ill-gotten gains. But do you know what wouldn't be an ill-gotten gain? Clicking the like button and subscribing to the channel if you enjoyed the video. It's free and only takes a couple of seconds and you can always unsubscribe later. Much love to you all, thanks so much for watching. You guys know what I'm talking about?